Hello, everyone. I'm Monjima Sharkar, and I welcome you all to this panel discussion on cultural identity and ideology, curated under TMYS Review in association with Oxford University Press. Under this theme, TMYS Review December 2022 will explore the role of artistic endeavors of society in shaping cultural identity and ideology. I would also like to say that we are calling for submissions of stories, essays, and poems. And for project architecture and submission guidelines, please visit www.tellmeyourstory.biz. Today's topic of discussion is motion pictures, tracing the shift from traditional to VFX. We are honored to have with us Professor Govind Pandey and Dr. Daniel Maddock as our esteemed speakers for the panel. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. I shall Thank now you. quickly introduce. I shall now quickly introduce our speakers. Professor Pandey has published more than sixty research papers and articles in leading journals of communication and newspapers in India and abroad. He has produced seventy educational films for NMEICT project of CEC New Delhi. He has authored three books. Professor Pandey has been the coordinator of an international film festival, First Frame, started by MBICEM in New Delhi. He organized the first ever Holocaust film festival in South Asia in 2009. His documentary film, Kachra Kachra Zindagi, won special appreciation at Prakriti Film Festival, organized by CEC New Delhi. He has been a recipient of the Bhasha Mitra Award given by Hindi Bhasha Sansthan, Lucknow. One of the films he supervised got first prize in television for environment competition. The film was screened at the United Nations Conference in Poland. Professor Pandey is working for the growth of the art and culture of India as Pranth Pramuk of Rashtriya Kala Manch, Avad Pranth. Now let me introduce my next speaker. Dr. Daniel Maddock has a background in internationally award-winning media production and a particular interest in visual and digital literacies and the use of media in pedagogical practice. Daniel is the Australian representative on the editorial panel for the world's first academic journal about cinematography, Cinematography in Progress. And his PhD thesis on the practice of cinematography was nominated for the Chancellor's Medal for Excellence in PhD Research at Griffith University. Dr. Daniel's research focuses on the form of film and creative media and how it is constructed for meaning in addition to and in support of the media's content. Dr. Daniel has also published internationally broadcast and award-winning television drama, internationally award-winning short films, and nationally broadcast documentaries. We are extremely privileged to have you with us today. Now, without further delay, we shall start with today's session. Professor Bande, I request you to please present your views on today's topic over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Majima Sarkar, first for inviting me as a panelist to give my views on a very important topic, motion pictures, tracing the shift from traditional to VFX. Uh, if we go back in, in history and try to understand motion picture in India, Lumiere brothers were the one who basically brought motion picture. When it was first screened in Mumbai's Watson Hotel, the arrival of train and the visuals were so mesmerizing that those who were sitting in the front row, when they saw that image of train coming towards them, they started screaming and started running as if the um, the train will, you know, uh, cross them. So the importance of visuals are uh, uh, in India is uh, visible 
and if we look at the development of motion picture uh, photography or cinematography in india india was not far behind because it started in france limir brothers first started screening in france and after that just one year uh, they came to india and indian you know filmmakers got motivated and they produced first film 1913 raja harishchand and we all know that uh, how much uh, you know uh, effort was involved in making the first film and if you look at the socio political you know the uh, angle of making this particular film raja harishchand so when he was making raja harishchand he was looking for a female uh, protagonist and he was not able to find a female protagonist for his film so somebody gave him idea that uh, you know you should go to a, a prostitute and ask her to work in your film but socially film making was not recognized in india and there was no social recognition even the prostitute you know, refused to work in uh, raja harishan and uh, look at this particular incident uh, clearly indicates the social recognition of films in india in 1930 and if we look at the development of film after that in 1930 to 1931 when we uh, made first uh, you know the toki alamara and uh, after that after independence the film industry in india is now the most important industry if we look at culturally because it is not only promoting you know different you know uh, you know subject matter which is very important for the indian society uh, i i i'll just try to give you example of you know the how cinema was portraying you know issues of development and several other issues which were very important for the indian so- society in 1936 a film called achhut kanya this film was a brave attempt to highlight the uh, issue of untouchability and the director has you know guts to uh, you know uh, uh, take an attempt to portray the issue which was really very important for the indian society similarly in 1953 when bimal rai made a film do bigha zameen uh, with the help of the character sambhu mehto he uh, you know gave us you know indications about the issues of development if you analyze that film and see that the issues that he raised through that uh, uh, you know through sambhu mehto was issues of migration issue of you know the uh, you know lab, uh, bo- uh, you know bonded laborers and there are other you know several issues even issues of farmers who were forced to uh, migrate to you know urban centers to look for you know the day to day you know earnings so cinema since its beginning uh, you know presenting issues uh, which were very important for the indian society but unfortunately we have taken cinema or cinematic construction as uh, you know part of you know entertainment and the leadership the initially uh, the leadership after independence they did not take cinema very seriously or the visuals uh, very seriously though cinema is an audio visual medium but visuals are dominating one they basically you know uh, give us indication about what is happening in and around our you know the society the development of modern cinematography also and modern cinematography equipment particularly um, after 2000 liberalization 1990 if you look at you know the uh, you know the, if you look at the uh, film making in india you will find that the shift from uh, issues which were first uh, the cinema was focused on mythology so issues from uh, are you know the ancient culture and other uh, things dominated the early part of the indian cinema after that when we got independence after that we the romanticism basically the rajesh kanna or others you know the uh, dominated the era with uh, the you know the, the what we call it the uh, freedom 
or the independence that we got and we started celebrating independence through cinema but soon we realized that uh, this independence is basically you know not for everybody not for the whole society so we saw the emergence of uh, you know angry young man through amitabh bachchan or through the character uh, through that uh, you know the different characters he played in cinema we saw the problems of indian society and indian society since beginning reflected the issues that were you know um, that, that were you know uh, somehow uh, uh, creating problems in the society and uh, developmental issues as well but policy makers have never taken uh, the construction uh, has the policy makers have never uh, basically never taken you know the uh, cinematic construction as you know the indication of maybe you know uh, if they have taken those uh, visuals seriously they have implemented in their policy and programs and the development model that we see today uh, would have been completely different again uh, today we are talking about you know the technological development and cinematography as we see in you know the earlier films cin cinematography is basically combination of several elements cin cinematography is not only about you know composition cinematography is not only about camera movement cinematography is not about only you know technical things lighting and other things cinematography is basically about you know constructing visuals which are uh, you know appealing which are important which can you know uh, tell us more about you know the uh, society as well but these days when we see the computer generated uh, you know images now the problem that we see with the technological development that the human emotions are rather you know taking back seat and the um, technology is taking uh, you know the uh, you know uh, basically emerging in the foreground so the human emotions are now less in the constructions of visuals and the technology is uh, you know dominating the constructions of human visuals and uh, this is also promoted by you know the leading organizations are also if you look at the uh, award which uh, film basically got award in recent you know times so the academy award also for best cinematography when to avatar in 2009 the visuals of avatar was stunning and hugo in 2011 or life of pi in 2012 if you look at the visuals of or the composition of uh, you know these films they are you know out of the box idea they 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 you know present it and the uh, visuals are stunning we cannot think even uh, about you know the uh, lighting and camera movement and the kind of you know de detail they have presented in these films and they were you know uh, attracted the audience in a large number and that's why they were able to draw uh, not only uh, audience but they were very successful in terms of you know attracting finances also and this uh, again you know gave uh, opportunity to others also to look for you know um, the computer computer you know generated images and from here cinema started showing you know changes in terms of construction of visual cinematography is not only about you know creating constructing visuals it is also about you know uh, physically going to a place and then you know uh, uh, meeting with each other planning for you know the shot then looking for the physical lights and uh, uh, you know the uh, helping crew members to uh, you know uh, to remain together and to uh, see that a shot is taken when you take a shot physically and when you uh, you know achieve a particular uh, lighting or uh, a particular shot the the you know the joy of taking a physical you know uh, shot physically and constructing light uh, with the help of uh, human brains is different than the construction uh, with the help of you know the com computers so the uh, computer cannot replace you know um, humans but we 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 know that the uh, compositors are creating stunning visuals these days uh, what i just want to uh, point out here that cinematography is different until now what we have witnessed in cinema is a completely different cinema now what we are basically watching is kind of you know uh, visuals which are very close to 
animation or anim uh, animated films. If you compare the films that we used to see earlier and the film that we see today, uh, the visuals are more and more becoming similar in nature. There is no variety uh, in terms of you know the composition or lighting or you know uh, you know uh, and other you know elements of cinema. Uh, recently, when we saw in South India a very you know, blockbuster film Bahubali, Bahubali one and then, uh, uh, two, if you look at the trend now. Everybody in uh, South India or in uh, Mumbai, they are, you know, following the uh, image construction uh, techniques that is basically followed in Bahubali. So what are we witnessing today? We are basically witnessing similar videos in uh, similar, you know, composition in cinema, which is, uh, which is basically, you know, uh, taking cinema to, I, I, I won't say at a, a higher level, but visually, uh, cinema or cinema's, you know, elements are uh, becoming more and more monotonous rather than giving us variety. So uh, my suggestion to uh, cinematic uh, world that we can, you know, we can create category where we can keep cinematography, physical cinematography as one, you know, form of cinematography and then virtual cinematography. So we can have, you know, um, uh, two different uh, category also where the construction of visuals created by uh, you know the virtual technique and construction of visuals particularly done by the human brain or human uh, physically so we must distinguish between the visuals that are uh, generated or constructed or created by the humans and the visuals that are uh, you know generated or constructed by the uh, technology we have to draw a line. If we will not draw a line, then uh, I hope that the uh, the subject matter also, you know, uh, will see um, similar, you know, the compositions and views which will, uh, you know, make cinema or cinema being monotonous and it will uh, not improve the cinematic engagement or the cinematic uh, experience. Rather, I feel that the technology which we are following blindly will, uh, you know, um, give us not much scope for, you know, the uh, variety of, you know, visuals. So in, a, in this particular, you know, uh, starting uh, segment, I just want to point out a few things that the physical cinematography and the virtual cinema cinematography should should have proper distinction and when it comes to uh, giving award to uh, for cinematography we must follow uh, up, uh, must follow this particular you know guideline that is cinema if a particular cinema is highly influenced or the visuals are uh, majority of the visuals are constructed by the computer or compositors then we should we, we shall not call it uh, cinematography rather we can call it virtual cinematography and then if the cinema is constructed or the visuals are constructed by the uh, humans mainly then we can call it cinematography the shift is i know that from we started from 1896 when cinema was known as flicks but uh, after that, we have improved in technology also. And if you look at the uh, cinematic experience, whether we uh, use an analog medium or any other medium for the construction of visuals, we are processing it digitally. So cinema today is a digital uh, you know, uh, medium. This is what I feel. So uh, I feel that when we, uh, you know, um, uh, when, whenever we write, we must write, uh, uh, cinematography, which is basically physical and virtual cinematography. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for uh, such a concise but delightful talk on uh, the impact of VFX on Indian cinema and how you have distinguished between uh, virtual and physical cinematography. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Daniel Maddox, sir. I request you to please present your views on today's topic. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Manjima, for having me today and, and to join Professor Pandey as uh, such a depth of knowledge in, in Indian cinema and cinema gen generally. It's great to be um, sharing the this, this stage with you and, and speaking with you today. 
Um, I guess the, the, the discussion here about the transition um, between traditional cinematography and, and what we have now, this, this sort of VFX heavy cinematography, suggests that, or well, the title of this talk suggests that, that that there was a transition. And I think, you know, what I'd like to point out to the audience is, is that, um, that perhaps there wasn't a transition and that uh, the two are one in the same and that it's always been happening. And that really what the transition was, was a confusion about the role and use of computers in uh, filmmaking, which really came about in the late 80s, but but sort of hit the stage um, with, with quite a force um, with films like Jurassic Park um, in, in the early 90s. But if we step all the way back into time, really very early into the, the first films ever made in cinema, uh, we, we look at, of, of Professor Bandy mentioned the Lumiere brothers, look at the Lumiere brothers' work and it's really documenting uh, uh, circumstances that existed so you know his Lee factory is a classic example and of course the train is another classic example these were situations where the, where the brothers put the camera up and allowed what was going to happen happen and and they they captured it they recorded it there, there wasn't a great deal of pre-production design um, a, a thought put into it if we take a step back even further to photography, to the idea of still uh, lens work before motion, and note that cinematography was really born out of uh, photography happening first, um, then um, we can sort of think about why it might be that there is this um, strong relationship with reality when it comes to filmmaking, this idea that what should be presented in front of the lens should be real, should be realism, or, or perhaps should be a better term might be verisimilitude. It should uh, feel like it's real. Um, one idea is that um, there was a, a, a famous, um, a famous uh, a theorist um, uh, and uh, he said that uh, photographs, he said about photographs, um, this American theorist, theorist and philosopher, he said that, that instantaneous photographs especially uh, are very close to what they're representing. Uh, Charles Pierce said that they correspond point, to, point by point to nature. In other words, they look exactly what they are taking a picture of. So in much the same way that uh, a statue can represent something, a photograph can represent the thing that it's taken a photograph of, um, but much more closely than other artwork had in the past. And so Pierce invented this idea of signs in semiology and, and he thought of this as being a second class of sign, as he thought of it as being something by physical connection. And I think when we have this idea of cinema being virtual, we're having a virtual thing or something in cinema that wasn't captured with the camera, then all of a sudden we seem to have broken that idea of the physical connection um, and then it's it's not not quite real. But at the same time, we have to remember that um, what, what a lot of people don't know is, is, is that this has always been happening. We, we think that visual effects heavy films are happening today but they, they've always existed in cinema. One of the popular sort of examples of this is, is the work of Melier um, with films like A Trip to the Moon. Um, and that's, a, that's popular um, because it's been represented so many times. It's been alluded to so many times in other films. But there were films even earlier than that. So if we think about the work of um, the Lumiere brothers happening in 1895, we think of that first presentation, the first production uh, of film and then presentation of it as a, as a cycle of cinema in 1895. It was only in 1898 um, that a filmmaker uh, called George Smith uh, made a film called The Corsican Brothers. Uh, in this film, he covered actors in black velvet, parts of them in black velvet, and he, he rewound the film and shot it again. And they seem to um, appear and disappear and appear like ghostly figures in, 
in on the camera and this this was a very 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 early example of um of visual effects but there are effects that were happening in the photographic days that then transitioned to cinematography very similar to what we do today except just without the computer so norman dawn was a was a great example um of, of someone working in this area he started off as a photographer and in his early days he used a, a process he didn't invent this process but it was it was a process to use a lot um, where he would capture pictures of of something through a piece of glass and he could paint on that piece of glass and that that would allow him to cover something up which is essentially what we do when we we do visual effects today we don't it's, it's often called removing we might remove something we don't want to see in the, in the photo but we don't or the, or the uh, video the cinema but we don't remove it we actually paint over the top of it uh, and reconstruct that image so uh dawn did this for a film in 1907 called missions of california where he um, found dilapidated uh, missions that were set up in uh, the United States uh, by the Spanish, and they were all fallen apart. Um, of course, it had been a, quite a long time since they were useful, and uh, he shot them through a glass plate, um, which became a common technique for, for many decades, and he painted over the dilapidated parts. He'd paint their roofs back on the, the buildings, he would paint trees out the front to cover up piles of rubble and so forth. And this uh, made the buildings appear as if they were fresh, if they were new at the time. So even though he wasn't making a fantastical uh, drama uh, with flying superheroes and all sorts of fun things, he was still creating a, um, a, a make-believe uh, type of world in a historical setting uh, almost in a documentary type setting really so this is something that's always been done but we often don't know about it because uh for many decades it, it was really it was covered up there was at that time uh particularly once the studio system began in the 20s and the 30s and, and really all the way up to the 60s there was a, a big push by studio heads to cover up a lot of the visual effects that were occurring at this time it was called special photographic effects and the workers who were all cinematographers and map painters were asked if they would like to um, forego a screen credit in order to make more money and a lot of them said yes and uh, that they, they weren't uh, noted and, you, and you'll find that they're not noted on those films uh, they're also the, the, stu the systems they worked in, the, the places they worked in, sorry, they, they would cover up the windows. And so their work wasn't published. I think today we know so much about the work of visual effects artists because of um, things like behind the scenes documentaries, um, how films have made, which has really been something that's come about in the last few decades um, and not before, has been of interest to a lot of uh, film goers. And, and that's where we've sort of found out a lot about this, but, but this has existed. Um, and it has even existed in uh, fantastical uh, ways, in, in giant, big, exciting ways. Um, if you think about um, films like Jason and the Argonauts, for instance, with all the clay figurines and, and you know, I'll grant that it's not as flashy and amazing as a, a Marvel film uh, these days, but it is still the same uh, idea at its core of creating an old universe um, in camera. And so the, the addition of computers, um, uh, which, which occurred, you know, uh, in a big way in, in a film like Jurassic Park in 1993, the addition of computers in a film like that um, seemed to change the way films were going and map painters and the, the idea of special photographic effects or capturing work through glass um, uh, plates and so forth and, and using map painting techniques um, and double and triple and quadruple exposures and, and, and the sort of work they did for Star Wars, for instance, that um, 
started to slip away because it could be done in a computer. But the real question is whether or not this is different to what came before. Certainly, cars are faster now uh, as a way to compare, but are cars any different to cars that were made at the turn of the century? They still have an internal combustion engine. You know, maybe cars of the future with batteries could be could be said to be different. But, you know, by way of comparison, they're essentially the same thing with some technological improvements. And, and that would be my argument of film, that essentially the same thing's happening here. Cinematography has always had a virtual aspect from the very beginning, and I mean the very, very beginning, the first days of cinema. Um, and that has continued on. It's just, it's not well known. Um, that's, that's, why the, that's why we haven't learnt about it. Um, especially um, in in the Hollywood press, um, but it has been, you know, if you th th there's a film which I'm sure you you're all aware of called Metropolis, um, which was made in 1927 in Germany, and you know if you want to see a superhero film in the 20s, this looked like you know uh, Batman before Batman existed, at Gotham on grand scale. This film um, shows flying cars and uh, a city of the future. And it, it is quite astonishing what was achieved through partial mirrors and miniature sets combined with live actors and so forth. And, and you know, very convincing as well. All of which is company, uh, accomplished without computers. Um, what computers did was um, really make a few things perhaps a bit easier uh, to do. Uh, perhaps maybe a little bit more convincing, although, you know, depends um, on the film and, you know, it's very hard to make that argument. Um, but, but certainly it's become the easier way to do things um, these days and it's certainly much more well-known amongst the popular, um, the, you know, film goer, uh, this visual effect idea and, and you know, the, the way it's done in, in Marvel films. But uh, my argument would be that it's always been there. It's essentially essentially the same thing. And if we look at films, you know, Professor, the Professor mentioned um, Life of Pi, which was a very controversial film. There was a, a famous, uh, well-known Australian cinematographer who made comment about that film being uh, uh, not, not uh, cinematography um, because it had visual effects in it. But, you know, the, the Claudio and Miranda did a lot of work on that film to make sure that the cinematography and the visual effects matched up. And moving on from that film to other films in the future, cinematographers are quite commonly uh, working in the virtual space with virtual cameras um, uh, to, to make sure those two worlds blend. And essentially, when you're talking about visual effects, what, what's happening with the computer there a lot of the time is it's being treated like a virtual camera. But a lot, of, a lot of that work is still virtual, is, is still cinematography. It's, it's virtual cinematography. It's not with a physical camera, but the cameras are often treated uh, in the same way with the same rules. And usually when they're not, the audience doesn't like it. They don't like the new language of cinema that's created from that. And it's, it's not often... Uh, accepted uh, well by the audience so it's always existed and um, and I think there wasn't much of a transition it's just that when computers came in it became quite a notable thing and uh, a reason for people to pivot on that idea that that it was different when it when it I think it's always been the same thank you so much sir it was an enlightening talk and you helped us trace the journey of visual effects in the context of world cinema, uh, for sure. So now um, I would like to begin our question and answer session. My first question is to Professor Pandey. So uh, do you agree that the grandeur offered by visual effects and computer graphics is uh, somehow robbing modern cinema of subtlety and nuances? See, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Daniel, that uh, animation was part of, you know, cinema and cinematic, you know, journey. When we started, cinema basically developed its own language 
and we call it a uh, visual grammar when first time we saw the film the great train robbery in 1903 i think um, uh, when it was you know five scenes were clubbed together to give us a concept of narrative in cinema first time so the the things that we developed over a period period of time is changing gradually and that change is visible not today only it is visible since the inception of since the coming of cinema or this medium uh, starting of this medium and changes are you know gradually uh, you know uh, changing the way we were consuming cinema the way the way we were constructing visuals it is it is about you know understanding the uh, you know the feeling when we watch german expressionistic cinema we know that when german you watch the cabinet of dr calgary you will find there is a subtle you know way of um, uh, you know makeup or you know the lines are drawn in a particular way or there is a loud makeup or the shadow is playing very important role all these minute things were basically part of you know the art so cinema was not only uh, treated as construction of visuals but it is also for me it is an art form so it started and when we when we see expressionistic cinema we get different visuals when we see say uh, you know uh, uh, film noir uh, film visuals from film noir we we get the feeling of you know femme fatale from where the cons- uh, from expressionism to film noir to realism so this cinema developed over a period of time and gave us different you know visuals and those visuals were creation of you know the human our our, our feeling and if you look at the visuals of you know expressionistic cinema uh, look at the you know historical background as well germany was going through a very you know a uh, bad phase first world war they lost first world war and after that their society was you know changing there was no security women and everything so everything was reflected in cinema and they uh, they, they they basically constructed the expressionistic visual which was direct revolt against expressionistic art form so cinema um, basically when uh, we see the visuals visuals are not simple things to just uh, for entertainment there are more to learn from the visuals which we see on a screen so those things when we generate it through computer or computer you know generated images uh, we hardly see the you know the the you know uh, balance in the composition or the beauty in the composition we see similar visual, uh, visuals and yes it is changing the concept of you know good and bad why because you know if you are a good compositor you hire a good compositor and you will get you know similar visuals and for me watching similar things is not joy uh, it is not beautiful you need something to compare with and when you watch the construction of a uh, beautiful composition by the human and their uh, which goes with their feelings their their ideology and their uh, different art form that makes me you know a more you know uh, engrossed or engaged with the cinematic construction rather than computer generated you know the images thank you so much sir for your answer and for establishing the comparison uh, we certainly understood the academic value of uh, cinematic visuals and how important it is for us to learn from these visuals Uh, so my next question to you is uh, do you agree that a few years from now there will not be a big difference between uh, celluloid television and gaming platforms in terms of the visual effects they'll explore in their projects see i have already answered it because you know if you go through the things that i have explained cinema is becoming or the cinematic uh, construction is becoming more and more my audible so now you are we lost you for a few seconds okay so what i am just uh, you know uh, trying to inform that 
cinematic construction basically till now followed a particular grammar which we call it visual grammar and with the help of those grammar we constructed you know uh, you know uh, meaning and the meaning is uh, well uh, appreciated by the audience now the construction of meaning or narrative uh, structure that we followed till now is completely changed and uh, you know the compositors are now playing very important role in developing you know the meaning or developing the visuals so when compositors compositors you know replaced cinematographer it simply means that cinema has lost its soul cinematography is basically soul of cinema and when you replace the soul of the cinema with somebody else i know that the uh, cinematographer still plays very important role in the construction of visual because they will definitely be there to look at the construction of visuals with the help of you know the compositors are similar to what they have you know visualized uh, look at the film avatar the visuals are stunning but can we call it uh, the real one why cinema started because cinema is, cinema is something which when it started was a portrayal of reality Lumiere brothers did nothing but they captured reality and uh, you know uh, screened it. So cinema, since its beginning, was very close to reality, and we were trying to use this medium to uh, uh, you know communicate about things that are happening in our society. And in in a way, cinema is shifting its base from showing reality or real more real issue than. Uh, you know the uh, going through going for you know the uh, uh, images that are not very real. Thank you, sir, for your answer. Uh, cinema is losing its soul. That is something uh, that will stay with us for for a really long time. And now um, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Madhav a few questions. So, uh, do you agree that VFX has enabled larger than life concepts, uh, say, for example, in Avatar, Godzilla, Transformers? Uh, and they are brought on the screen, which were urged while not possible through human articulation. Well, I think, you know, I, as I was saying before, we, we had films in the past that had larger than life uh, examples of, of um, uh, a you know, special fantastic beasts and uh, and those sorts of things. Certainly, I, I agree with you that there's probably more of those today, uh, more of those types of films today, and they probably are more. Uh, they're probably bigger than they than they used to be. They're probably more fantastic. Um, the technology's moved on and has allowed us to to make things even uh, bigger than they were. But you know, Mary Poppins uh, was was a pretty fantastical film. Um, and there were no computers there, uh, so so was uh, so were a lot of films in in that period. And as I've talked about before, you know Eugene Shifton's, Shifton's work on on the um, film Metropolis in 1927, you know, it's an amazing uh, film. Unfortunately, he had to leave Germany uh, with the beginning of the war, uh, but he did later on in the 60s win Oscar in in uh, America for for best cinematography. And and he you know he met to the Shupton process this idea of using a, a partial mirror uh, to blend live action miniatures with uh, you know real people to make these um, fantastical environments and, and and that went on to be used for decades uh, and wasn't really replaced until computers um, came to be used so um, it's you know I I kind of agree with it on. Uh, in one way, because there are more films uh, that have more larger than life concepts today than, than there probably used to be. Um, but there, there was always this case for the larger than life film, um, even all the way back to the 20s. Um, so I think the the question really comes from comes from a space where it's often misconstrued by, misconstrued by film critics that that you know, as we were saying earlier, that there is this difference, that there is this new digital age phenomenon in filmmaking. Um, but as I've said, that the literature shows that, that the effect film, the special effect film has always been there. Um, it's, but I think just today, it's more obvious. This is, we've simply extended the obviousness of um, that film and democratise the tools. They're cheaper than ever, and and it's possible for for someone to, with some training, with some uh, research, to to make 
you know, visual effects on, on their computer. They might not be as great as Hollywood, but that but it's possible for them to begin doing that sort of work on their own home computer. So it's democratized the tools in that way. Um, and and it's I think it's more clear to to the film going public that these larger than life films exist and, and that they're made and that they're made due to the kid uh, like it used to be um, in in that uh, sort of 20s through to the 60s um, when people weren't credited and they were offered more money not to be credited and, and so forth. Um, but but as I said, it's, it's always existed. So it's just more obvious and more of it today. Uh, so, sir, can we say that uh, our uh, our accessibility to creating visual effects in cinema uh, has increased today, and we can create visual effects in cinema more than we used to in the past, maybe? Yeah, absolutely. I think so, and I think they're created uh, they they're created more easily and and more commonly in ways that we don't even know i mean of course you know um the marvel series of films it's quite obvious that they use visual effects in, and in a big and a very loud way um but it's it's not so obvious to film going pub public that that probably almost every film they see um has visual effects uh, in a small way things like sky replacement is such a common technique um these days you know, you a director will go out to shoot a sunny scene and it's overcast. It's a bit annoying and, and it doesn't work for the film because that's what we're supposed to have a sunny scene for this situation. And instead of waiting for the weather to be good because, you know, there's, there's time constraints here, they turn on the lights. Um, and we can't fix the sky, that, that's a problem, but we can fix it. In, in visual effects and and it's a very simple thing to fix in visual effects it's really quick get it in there for that big wide shot the establishing shot and then we move into the medium close up and we don't have to worry about it anymore and so it doesn't really cost money and it's it's effective so you know i would argue that you probably don't realize that that most films today use visual effects just not necessarily um with a big wow factor uh, like Avatar and, and and those sorts of films. Thank you, sir. And uh, it obviously tells us how we can deal with the physical limitations in, in filmmaking now. Uh, so my next question to you is, uh, with the heavy reliance on VFX in modern cinema, do you think CGI will eventually be able to replace uh, human actors convincingly? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting question because it, it, it happened so recently um, in the Star Wars films um, when when a, an actor, a, an actor who had passed away in recent years was replaced um, uh, so that they could continue on with the narrative. And, and I would argue that um, although it was not you know, certainly 100 percent effective, um, it, it was very convincing. But, it, but what it did do was it added to the narrative of the Star Wars films and tied them all together to add to a continuity, um, even though the actor wasn't around uh, to perform that role anymore. But the question really is, I think, is, is would they do that uh, sort of thing if the actor still existed? And the answer would, of course, be no. Um, and also the question is, even if we could do it in a 100% con convincing way, w would we do it? And I think... You know, you know, I've been talking, Professor Pandy's been talking here about this a lot, is, is that actors, cinematographers, these people that make films are the, the soul of, of cinema, that we want to see people on films. Um, animations are wonderful things. To watch. We, we, when we watch a live action film, we're going for the live actors. And I think there, there may be a role for, for CGI characters, for safety reasons, um, for practicality reasons, for, for stunts, fight scenes perhaps, um, and, and other sorts of situations. But but I don't think it's possible to replace an actor, even if the image was 100% um, convincing, um, because it's not just about the image, it's about, it's about the actor's whole personality. Um, it's about the actor off screen as well as on screen. 
you know, would you replace Tom Cruise with a, a CGI version of Tom Cruise? You know, a lot of Tom Cruise is the man, not not the character, the person off screen, as well as um, the, the character that's being played. Certainly, so uh, I agree with you. It's the contribution of the actor in cinema. And that was a wonderful answer. Uh, with this, we now come to the end of today's session. I would once again like to say that we are calling for submissions of stories, essays, and poems. And for project architecture and submission guidelines, please visit www.tellmeyourstory.biz. I extend a heartfelt thanks to Professor Govind Pandey and Dr. Daniel Badak for this wonderful and remarkable session. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Mentor.